cards as you're able. <laughs> Let's walk together for a while and ask where we begin to be. To come and know God's grace, all are welcome, the love of God to share, cause all of us are welcome here, all are welcome in this place. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Happy good morning to you. Wow. It's really great to see everyone out this morning. What a treat to have you here. What a treat for all of us to be able to be here this morning. My name is Pastor Kenny. That pastor thing still scares me sometimes. Just It ought to scare you. Uh, <laughs> I'm the associate pastor here. And, of course, Pastor Marcia, who is our lead pastor, our main pastor, is taking some time off uh, for the next few weeks. And so we're giving her a chance to sort of decompress and rest and relax and recover and come back and knock us between the eyes, I guess, when she gets back. But we're thrilled that you're here with us this morning, and we're just so delighted. If you're here for the very first time, we want to let you know that we hope this is the first time of many times that you're able to join us here at BUCC. And as far as we're concerned, you're already family. One of the things we love to do right off the bat is say hello to one another. So why don't you take a moment and turn to those closest to you and hug a neck, shake a hand and let them know how delighted you are to see them this morning. <laughs>
seated if you'd like. That's what we want everyone to feel when they come into this place. We want you to know that you are very, very welcome. We have a lot of things that are always going on here at BUCC. We have several folks who are traveling today and out of town. I've heard from a lot of folks this week who said uh, we're going to be out for this Sunday or next Sunday for a little bit during the summer as they travel. So we miss those folks. Uh, but some of them, as a matter of fact, have told me, uh, uh, Richard, where'd you go? I heard from one person this morning who was asking about the work day and wanting to know what was going on. So give us some details on uh, this Thursday's work day. We will be having a work day this Thursday. There are about five different projects that we'll be working on. Um, one of the projects is going to be to clean decks. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of a project that we're going to be doing this Thursday. Um, so we're going to be here Wednesday uh, washing the decks off and get all the crud off of them that needs to come off before we seal them. So if anyone wants to volunteer, come help wash the decks first on Wednesday. That would be greatly appreciated. And then Thursday, we're going to have like five different projects that we're going to do. That's going to be cleaning the windows, cleaning this front window inside and out, and then some yard work and cleaning the bushes on the outside. You can cut down, trim back down where they need to be. So that's what we'll be doing Thursday. Perfect. What time does everybody need to be here on Thursday? Six o'clock both, both days, Wednesday and Thursday. So if you can come and help with that, that would be greatly appreciated. And the more folks who show up, the quicker we get it done and the quicker we can go home and find the Golden Girls on TV. <laughs> Georgetown Pride is coming up this Saturday. Is that right, Liz? Go ahead and give us some details. And we're still looking for a few people to sign up. Um, we still have some open slots to come, so just come one hour. Um, we're not asking a lot, so please sign up if you can. And it will be this Saturday, this coming Saturday on the 20th, 21st. And it was, it's going to be at the Royal Park at um, Georgetown. What time does it get started? Um, it starts at 11, but we're trying to get people there early, so if you can come early and help set up. Fantastic. And it lasts until? five or so something like that so it's not a super super long day but it's a very enjoyable day so get with Liz if you need some more information and if you're able to help us go and staff the uh, the tables there at Georgetown Pride that would be fantastic we just think it's very important that God has a presence at these events and at these places and we want to be able to represent that as best we can vacation Bible school is coming up it starts next week Lynn you can give us some details about that and then Steve or do you want Steve to go ahead and perfect Good morning, everybody. My name is Steven. I'm one of the uh, vacation Bible school teachers this year and um, we are going to be passing out flowers in the neighborhood next Sunday right after church so if you want to wear something cool and let's hit the pavement and let's get us some kids also one other thing um, we're starting um, with notch and that is we're going to have a Nosh, Nosh Pantry, um, which each week we'll have a drive of a food item, and um, this week is meat, so if you get your canned meats from Kroger while you're getting your shopping and bring them to the Big Blue Barrel, we'd appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Stephen. We uh, had a discussion at our council, our church council meeting this past week about extending what we do on Sunday morning is wonderful and it provides a meal uh, for that day. But Stephen has it in his heart and it's the heart of our church, really, uh, to be able to make sure that folks needs are met as best as we can help meet them. And so we decided to put together this uh, non-perishable food items drive and sort of target it each week. So if you when you come in next Sunday, if you think about it while you're at the market this week just go ahead and grab a can or two of that non-perishable meats and bring them and put them in the big blue barrel and we'll uh, we're going to put those sustaining nosh meals together for folks to be able to take with them so thank you Stephen for doing that and then of course vacation bible school don't forget that teenagers I just got word about 30 seconds in oh that's okay Lynn go ahead and listen I just, <laughs> I'm like a kid you know no that's good <laughs> I just wanted to say, because sometimes this gets lost after, you know, we go through planning vacation Bible school, and it's really, it's a lot of work, and there's a lot that uh, Billy and Stephen and I put into it, but we could not do it without help from other people, and I wanted to go ahead and recognize a couple people who have volunteered and given uh, materials and stuff, so Stanley and Richard, I appreciate you, uh, we couldn't do it without you, so I'm, I'm putting that kind of a little bit ahead of things. Thank you so much. 
Absolutely. It takes all of us. Thank you, Lynn, for recognizing them. I just learned, uh, just as I suited up and got ready to walk down the aisle, that we are going to be, we're going to postpone our teenagers from this Saturday coming up the 28th to the following Sunday, August the 4th. Bob, is that right? Yes. All right. Go ahead and give us some details on when it's happening. Okay. Uh, on the 28th, we've got some conflicts with the Thank you, Bob. So Saturday, August the 4th, uh, the teenagers will get together for lunch. And also on Saturday, August the 4th, Liz, we have our habitat built, and I think you said we filled all of our slots. Yes, we have. We are ready to give. We have our, all our slots filled up, and I cannot wait. We will be meeting here Saturday at 7 o'clock for our first meeting. Uh, we'll be meeting Super. So everyone who signed up for that Habitat Build, get with Liz and get all those details on when you're meeting and, and all the other pertinent details on that. And then, of course, we've already mentioned Nosh. We really believe that no one should ever be hungry. And it looked like, Deb, I think I saw some food back there. What you got for us? Ooh, sounds good. So today, if you're here and you need some food or you know someone who does, uh, all you got to do is on your way out the door, just pick it up and take it. Take it with you and enjoy that or share it with someone else who needs that meal because we really believe that no one should ever be hungry. There's always so much going on here at BUCC, and I think it's absolutely fantastic because we're touching people and we're reaching people for the good God we know and love. So let's pause for a moment. Take a deep breath. God's wonderful air. Now let's sing. Let's dream together of the day when earth and heaven are one. A city built of love and light, the new Jerusalem, where our morning turns to dancing, every creature lifts its voice, crying, welcome, welcome to this place, you're invited to come and know all are welcome, the love of God to share, cause all of us are welcome here, all are welcome in this place. We gather this day as God's antagonist. We gather this day as a people in rebellion. Knowing that God is aware of our limited vision. We gather this day as God's beloved. Feeling God's blood even in our country. 
Let's pray. God, we thank you that you love us in our stubbornness and our unwillingness to cooperate sometimes in our everyday lives. We thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to gather just like this as believers and questioners, sometimes doubters, wanderers, but always your people, gathered to sing your songs, to enjoy your spirit, and to learn about you and the wonderful world that you've gifted us with. We pray that you would use these songs, that you would use these words, you would use the, the prayers, the testimonies, that you would use our moment of communion and our moments of giving. That God, you would use all of it to point us toward you and let your will be done in our lives and in this place and ultimately in this world. We pray, we ask, and all who believed and agreed said, Amen. Please rise as you're able for our first hymn. Help us accept each other. Help us accept each other as Christ accepted us. Teach us as sister, brother, each person to embrace. Be present, God, among us and bring us to believe. We Sales accepted and meant to love and live. Teach us, O oh God, your lessons as in our daily life. We struggle to be human and search for hope and faith. Teach us to care. for some to love them as we find them or as they may become let your acceptance change us so that we may be moved in living situations to do the truth and love to practice your acceptance until we know by heart the table of forgiveness and laughter sealing guard God for to and bread bring us new eyes for seeing new hands for holding on renew us with your spirit God free us make us one beautiful you can be seated We're at that time where we gather every Sunday morning. Of course, we sing, we hug necks, we share. I mentioned to uh, some of you several weeks ago through a sermon that uh, I loved it when I heard from one of our folks who comes to church here who told me that she really, her favorite part of the whole service is that hug at the very beginning of the service. She said, I come to church every Sunday for that hug because I really sometimes just need a hug. We do, don't we? We really do. And sometimes we need to know that there are people who care. There are people who love us enough to care, to want to listen, 
uh, to our needs and to pray with us about those and to join us in our joys and in our rejoicing. So I wonder this morning if there's anyone here who has something that's just been bubbling on your heart, a joy or something that's happened for you this week or just a concern that you'd like to share with your church family. Anyone? Steve. Uh, Greg, why you please pray for my sister. She's in the hospital, our own doings, but it'll be all right. And just pray for those who suffer from addiction. Absolutely. Thank you, Stephen. Who else? We always start slow and then they bubble up. Liz? Please pray for my sister, uh, Christian's mom, is having difficulty with pain in her neck and her shoulder. Uh, she found that she has some kind of bone disease that uh, is really affecting her. It's not a lot of pain. And also, I just found out that my cousin in Los Angeles has cancer. She's been sick for six weeks. Her name's Misty. <coughs> Thank you. We'll pray. Who else? Oh, go ahead. Also pray for Karen. She's still in love. Karen, we're glad you're here this morning. Oh, I'm glad all of you are here. <laughs> <laughs> Keith? Absolutely. We're with you, Keith. We're with you. Who else? Richard? Uh, let's continue to pray for Lauren Lamore. Um, she found out that they found a mass and she has colorectal cancer. So let's continue to remember her and pray. We will. <laughs> My friend um, John is still in the hospital. Um, and I talked to his um, husband yesterday and the day before. And, um, still, uh, health is deteriorating, and they are um, a move to um, to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to a hospital up there for a um, possible uh, liver transplant. Um, they're, they're working off the testing and all that, but the doctors basically say that that's really his only chance to live. So, um, just prayers as they journey through this and prayers for the bureaucracy of insurance that that will, will work out like it's supposed to. So just prayers for all of that, John and Jesse, and all that's going on. Absolutely. How old is John? 35. Absolutely. Billy? Monica and I have a joy. Um, you know, Richard mentioned the church work day this uh, Wednesday and Thursday. And uh, if you're looking for a great way to stay physically engaged Thursday morning, we're going to be moving. And we wanted to share, you know, the opportunity to stay loose Thursday night. Um, we're going to be getting a van uh, Thursday morning, so that's kind of our gift to you all. Um, it's just a, a chance for some early morning, you know, waiting for each other. Otherwise, you would appreciate your prayers. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> Mason and I went last night to see the musical, The Music Man, at the Lexington Opera House. And if you've ever seen it, you know that it centers around these traveling salesmen, you know, who travel around the country and they're sort of dueling it out. And there's this guy on there who's an anvil, anvil salesman. And he says, there's not much market for it, but I got an idea. You'd sell some. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Billy. Stanley. I just want to thank God for thanking God for everything he does for me. There's a lady I work with, Amy Gerb, that's got a boyfriend has cancer. And uh, she's going to be back in about a week or so. See if he's going to have to have more chemo. And uh, remember everybody I work with and so positive today about all my family at my birthday and I remember uh, July 23rd I had my biopsy
will be praying, Stanley. Uh, when, when I said to you, remember uh, Belinda's brother, Doug, he is, uh, fell and broke his hip, hip and is now in Cardinal Hill Rehabilitation Center. Sorry. Thank you for reminding us. Stan. Um, I have two praises. So um, for some of you guys who know, my sister uh, has struggled with an autoimmune disease for the past seven years, and recently they found out that um, the certain dose of medication she was taking wasn't working as well, so they had to double the dose on Thursday. And we were concerned about her getting a reaction, but she actually, everything went really well. She didn't get allergic or anything, so um, that was a huge relief. And um, Austin and I have a friend named Trevor who we've mentioned. He has struggled with alcoholism. He's currently 23 days sober, so, you know, off to a good start. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing. Brandy? I have a few joys. One of my mom's here and feeling a lot better. And she wants to thank you for your prayers because she, she doesn't like to speak up <laughs> in front of groups. Um, and also, she really enjoys coming here. And she's actually been bugging me about when she gets to come back. And she's never wanted to, she's never enjoyed going to church, really. So. Wonderful. We're so thrilled you're here this morning. You make that chair look real good. <laughs> We're delighted you're here. Yes. Um, I would like to have some prayers for my family, mainly my older sister. Um, I'm not really close to my other sister and brother, but my older sister I am. And when I told her about Liz and I getting married, she was kind of really um, threw it out the window, and that kind of really hurt. I mean, I understand that my family doesn't down my relationship with the person that I love. However, they've always told me that they love me because I'm their sister, but that still, it still hurts. So prayers for them. Also prayers for the homeless and those who are suffering with addictions. I'm sorry you're dealing with that, Karen. A lot of us do. A lot of us do. So there are a lot of folks here who can understand that that grief, Stanley. I'm sure you all heard in the news week about the CEO of Pop John Carlin Stadium using the N word. We need to pray for our uh, auditions and people on high places to present their best foot forward. Absolutely. It's unfortunate that's the world we live in. So, so, so unfortunate. Let's prepare our hearts for prayer. I will come to you in the silence. I will lift you from all your fears. I claim you as my choice. Be still and know I am here. I am hope for all who are hopeless. I am eyes for all who long to see. In the shadows of I will be your light. Come and rest in me. Do not be afraid. I am with you. I have called you each by name. Come and follow me. Let's pray. God, before we name anything else, anyone else, 
we pause ourselves to call out those names, those situations, those places that haven't been mentioned this morning. But we know you're fully aware and fully capable of dealing with. So we pause. God, we bring these things to you, trust in you. We ask you to be with our pastor, Marcia, and her wife, Brenda. Be with Mama Jean and all of the family who just recently had to say goodbye to someone way too young. God, we pray that you would give them strength, continue to give them strength, continue to comfort them, as best they can know. God, we don't ask you to give them revelation of understanding or anything like that. We can't understand these things. With a sheet full of needs and concerns and emergencies, desires, God, we don't pretend to understand. But we trust you enough to know that you can deal with them. And you can help us walk through them. So just as we pray for Marcia, Brenda, and Mama Jean, we pray for Stephen's sister who's in the hospital. All of those who deal with and struggle with addictions. We pray for uh, Liz's sister, Christian's mom. We pray for Liz's sister who's been diagnosed with cancer. We thank you that Karen is here this morning, but God, she's still in pain. So we ask you to be with Karen. And God, our friend Keith, who's living these days lately in a dark place, in a hard place, I pray right now for Keith and all of those who are like him. And God, I ask you to uh, do your thing in Keith's life. Touch his heart. Give him some, some give him some peace in his mind. And then use him as an example of what you can do in a life like his. God, we pray for Lauren Lamore, recently diagnosed with cancer. Doug, Belinda's brother, Doug has been such a beautiful, strong advocate and encourager for so many of us in our community. Touch Doug. Give Belinda and the family strength. God, we pray for John, who's likely going toward a liver transplant, but he continues to deteriorate. And we pray for his husband, Jesse. We thank you that Billy and Monica and Ray are moving forward in their life and you've given them new and exciting opportunities. We pray that you would continue to bless them and continue to encourage them and help them see you wherever they go. Stanley's co-worker, Amy, her boyfriend has been diagnosed with cancer. Stanley himself is going for biopsy next week pray for those things. We pray for Stanley. We pray for Amy's boyfriend. And we pray for all of those as we always do at Hope Positive and Aval. We pray for Stanley's family and his birth mother. We're grateful that Steph's sister is responding to the medications and that Trevor is 23 days sober now. Wow. It's a beautiful 23 days. God, we're so glad that Brandy's mother's with us this morning. She sits among us as a part of our family. We pray that you would continue to touch her in her recovery. We pray for Karen's older sister, her family, and those who just can't seem to get their minds around the fact that love is love is love is love is love. And love comes from you because you are love. 
Help them know that realization because, God, it's so freeing and liberating. and It makes them happy. God, for those who are less fortunate and those who struggle, we've mentioned addictions, those who are homeless, those who are in situations in life that are maybe dangerous and harmful. God, bring them into our path so we can intervene in some way. Be in the remainder of this service and use it in a way that draws us closer to you. God, we'll always thank you because we believe that everything that's good and perfect comes from you. We ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. I am strength for all the despairing, healing for the ones who dwell in shame. All the blind will see, the lame will all run free, and all Our scripture reading today comes from Genesis 32, verses 22 through 31. Jacob got up during the night, took his two wives, his two women servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed the Jabbok River's shallow water. He took them and everything that belonged to him, and he helped them cross the river. But Jacob stayed apart by himself, and a man wrestled with him until dawn broke. When the man saw that he couldn't defeat Jacob, he grabbed Jacob's thigh and tore a muscle in Jacob's thigh as he wrestled with him. The man said, let me go because the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I won't let you go until you bless me. He said to Jacob, what's your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name won't be Jacob any longer, but Israel because you struggled with God and with men and won. Jacob also asked and said, tell me your name. But he said, why do you ask for my name? And he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel because I've seen God's face to face and my life has been saved. The sun rose as Jacob passed Peniel, limping because of his thigh. Bob read from the Common English version of the Scripture. We read from the message. There were a couple of things between the two that still need to come together, and we'll get there. Back when I was younger, a long time ago, I worked a summer or two as a lifeguard. Parents would sometimes come in and drop off their kids for me and the other teenagers to watch after. And those who did stay around the pool would usually spend their day either visiting with friends or napping or getting lost in a book. They pretty much left it to us younger adults at the pool to be their kid's keeper for the day. I guess it's good that they trusted us that much. And I guess 
they knew that being a certified lifeguard, which was all this particular pool would hire, meant that we had been trained on how to rescue and revive their kids if it ever became necessary. I remember my own training. I wasn't very confident in myself. I didn't feel like I was a particularly good swimmer on my own, and so having to swim for me and for somebody else made me really nervous. We'd been working on resuscitation techniques, and I was getting that sort of stuff down. But knowing that I was going to have to do a couple of water rescues during the training gave me lots of anxiety. So when the time came and our instructor started pairing off the drowners with the rescuers, I watched as each of the smallest victims were one by one assigned to comparable and more capable lifeguard trainees. But me... I got Mitchell. Mitchell was probably one of the most affable and fun people in our class. He was one of the younger ones in our group, but he was by far the tallest and broadest of everyone in our group. He was just a really big, fun guy to be around, and I had to rescue him from the deep end of the pool. I liked Mitchell. Everyone liked Mitchell. He was fun. That's why I couldn't understand for the life of me why in the world when it came time for me to rescue him, he kicked and screamed and started stiffing up and he fought against me while I tried to rescue him. And it wasn't until after we finally got out of the pool gasping and nearly throwing up, I realized that he wasn't really fighting my efforts to save his life. He just didn't completely trust my abilities to try to save his life. And that help that he offered nearly took both of us under. Thank God there were others there to save us <laughs> if it ever came to it, and it nearly did. <laughs> and just so you're aware, I'm aware of my own hypocrisy. I confess here and now that I had issues with my own rescuer when it came time for, my, for me to be the drowning victim. The inclination to fight our rescuers is apparently the natural thing to do. And for some reason, it's hard to completely trust the person who's trying to drag you out into dry ground. I remember once when I was about uh, 12 years old, I went on a camping trip with about 10 other guys my age. We were all newspaper carriers. We delivered uh, newspapers for the Richmond Register just down the road in Richmond. And our route supervisor took us all on a camping trip to the lake one weekend. We got to the lake, we found our spot, we pitched our tents, and then we all immediately ran straight for the lake. No one told me about the drop-off. I'm splashing around with all the other guys when all of a sudden the bottom disappears. And I panicked. I started flailing and trying to find something or someone to help me find uh, something to put under my feet other than water. And Jeff Curry was that someone. He saw my distress and he got to me as quickly as he could. And he still had a little bit of ground under him. So he reached out his hand for me to grab onto so he could pull me in. I didn't have time to ask him if he'd mind saving my life. I didn't have the luxury of asking him if he was even capable of saving my life. I just reached toward him. And instead of him pulling me in, I pulled him out. I pulled him out into the deeper water with me. And then I pushed him under, and I stood on his shoulders, <laughs> or his head, or whatever it was that was down there. But I know that my head was above the water. Talk about selfish. Good God. I was the picture of selfishness in that moment. I pushed my own friend underwater so I could stay above the water and breathe. Poor Jeff. He was one of my best friends. We'd known each other since first grade. He and I, along with our friend Danny Alexander, were known among our own, all of our friends as the three musketeers because where you saw one, you always saw the others. And Jeff had every reason to believe and every reason to never speak to me again after that. But after we both got out of the water and after he got out from underneath my panicked feet, underwater, mind you, pulled me back toward the shore, he just sort of gave me that puzzled look. 
I thanked him for being there and then I asked him not to tell our supervisor about it because I had to lie about my swimming skills to be able to come on the trip. He didn't tell and we remained really, really good friends for a long time after that. I've thought about it a few times since then. I panicked and nearly killed my rescuer. We tend to do that. Some of you here are nurses and others of you work in the medical field. You've seen or you've had patients who make your work to make them better, maybe even save their lives very, very difficult. They protest and they kick and they scream and they fuss. They likely know that you're looking out for their best interest, but for some reason, for whatever reason, their impulse is to resist. Today, Bob read to us the story of the night that Jacob, the Jewish patriarch, had a fight with a man believed to be God. I'm not talking about an argument fight. I'm talking about a knockdown, drag out fight where one of them left walking away with injuries. Now, to me, this story is really, really out there. I mean, it's, there are a lot of parts of this thing that require a whole lot of what I call faith license. It takes a whole lot of faith to take it as we read it. And honestly, I wrestled with this story. I wrestled with what I was going to say about this story. But what I know is that not every Bible scholar believes that this was actually a fight between Jacob and God. Many believe, if anything, that Jacob may have been duking it out with an angel. Not that that makes it any more believable. But regardless, here we are. Jacob and someone are wrestling to settle an argument. Now let me say this. I've never known anyone to ever get into a fight unless they have a reasonable idea that they can win. You get into a fight intending to win. So, getting into a fight with God and thinking you could ever, ever come out on top is just not thinking this thing through. I mean, if, if I can whoop God's butt on anything, then I'm not sure that that's the kind of God I want to be trusting myself to. Think about it. Anyone who picks a fight with God has to be delusional enough to think that they're stronger, smarter, wittier, and have more stay in power than God does. And if you believe that God's all-knowing and knows things before they ever happen, how in the world do you ever expect to get in a sucker punch? <laughs> it's just dumb to pick a fight with God and think you're going to win. And another thing about picking a fight with God, when you do such a thing, you're making God your adversary, your opponent. God is no longer your ally. And it also goes without saying that if you're fighting against God, it's because you think God is wrong about something. During the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln was purportedly asked if God was on his side. Sir, Lincoln replied, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side. For God is always right. Now, let me pause here for just a moment and say this. Saying that God is always right is a really huge general statement. God may always be right. But our take or our interpretation of who God is or what God does, what God says, or how God feels about a particular people or particular things isn't as concrete and sure as all that. I've had people tell me that God doesn't love me, and they've used the Scripture to try to prove it. They think they're right about it. But I've read the same Scripture, and I think they're wrong. So this whole story about Jacob fighting with God has left me with... A lot of questions. If Jacob was fighting with the almighty, all-knowing God, why did God have to ask his name? Since this man or angel or God or whatever it was had to end the fight at daybreak, was he a vampire? <laughs> Crazy things go on up here. The story says that whoever it was was not 
able to defeat Jacob. Now, let me ask you something. If this was God, does that give anybody else any pause to think that this God was not able to defeat a mere mortal, Jacob? There are a lot of questions, a lot of holes in this story. There are lots of questions that I've not been able to find satisfactory answers to. But I look at what I do know. And I remember that Jacob had a lot of internal struggles going on. Before this time, he hadn't been completely honest with his parents and his brother and family. He had deep-seated family hostilities going on. He was a determined man that some considered to be ruthless. He was a con artist. He was a, a liar and a manipulator. His name literally meant deceiver. More literally, it meant grabber, stealer. By the time we catch up with him here in this story today in his wrestling match with whoever it was, he was starting to feel the weight of that dishonesty, and he was on his way back to try and make amends with his brother, a brother who had vowed to kill him. And he wasn't sure that his brother was ready to bury the hatchet. But here he is. And this is what we do know about this moment and the man Jacob. Our scripture today says that the man wrestling with Jacob didn't kill him. Now, growing up as a church kid, I was sort of left with the impression that that was God's preferred way of dealing with things. Kill them, send them off to hell, and get it over with. But Jacob didn't die. As a matter of fact, when it was all said and done, although he came away with a limp that he never, ever got over, Jacob also came away with a new name. At the end of the fight and at the end of the night, God renamed Jacob. His old life and all of the things that weighed on him still belonged to him, but now he was a new man with a new name. He was Israel, which means the one who strives with God I've had my own issues with God. I've had moments when I questioned everything about this whole existence, God's existence, these words and these stories, my purpose, God's purpose. I've wrestled with my faith in God. I've cussed at God and pretty much dared God to interrupt me, especially when things are going good. Just like Jacob, although more in the psyche world or the spiritual world, I've had my own rounds with God. I've challenged God. I've even made the decision more than once or twice or more to walk away from God. Then there are the opposite times when I'm feeling romantic with God. And I feel I should be closer and more intimate. But sometimes getting close to God increases the risk of disappointment. In her book, Accidental Saints, Pastor Nadia Boltz Weber tells of the time that she was asked by a sincere young seminarian, Pastor Nadia, what do you do personally to get closer to God? Nadia replied, what? Nothing. That sounds like a horrible idea, trying to get closer to God. That's honest. Really? Half the time I want to be as close to God as I, can, as I can get. Then in the blink of an eye, I wish God would leave me alone. Getting close to God means I might have to love someone I don't even like or invest in someone or something that takes away from my personal life. It might mean letting go of an idea or a dream that's really dear to me. The story of Jacob's fight with the man or the angel or God or whoever it was leaves us with practical questions like this that I hope we don't get bogged down in because it also leaves us with a very powerful lesson. You can't do hand-to-hand -hand combat with someone from a distance. You cannot do hand-to-hand -hand combat with someone from a distance, even if it's God. Nadia, if you've noticed, I reference her a lot. She's a wonderful resource for inspiration and for living life. Look her up. 
Nadia says that despite all her failings, God may have gotten something beautiful done through her in the middle of those fights. Because it's then that she says she's confronted by the mercy of the gospel so much that she can't even hate her enemies. It's during those fights and those struggles that she says she's unable to judge the sin of someone else because her own sins are in the way. It's during those struggles that she says she has to bear witness to another human being suffering despite her desire to be left alone. She says that's when she's forgiven by someone even though she doesn't deserve it. And her forgiver does it because they're in the middle of their own fight with God and trapped by the gospel. And like us here at BUCC, when traumatic events happen in the world, we can't make sense of them. She says that she has a community that gathers with her every week to mourn and to pray with her. And then like us, when she ends up changed by loving someone she'd never choose to ever, ever choose on her own to love, God sends them her way to teach her about God's love. Fights can be brutal. They can be ugly. And they can be beautiful experiences where we sometimes walk away with an injury or a limp, but we walk away with a new name, with a new life. And you can't have those beautiful experiences or learn those incredible lessons without a tussle or two. Sometimes with someone else, often with yourself, and maybe even with God. So, maybe. Maybe it's time to look up, put up our dukes, say, okay, God, bring it on. Amen. I may have told you that I got into a fight once, a really bad one in, at Clark Moore's Middle School in Richmond, Kentucky. I was in the seventh grade and was supposed to be. Rocky was in the eighth grade and was supposed to be, I think, maybe in the tenth or the eleventh. I swung first. <laughs> Dumb. It was a school assembly. We were all in the gym, and at the end of the assembly, Rocky, just because he could, took my jacket and threw it underneath the bleachers. And I looked at him, and I said, you get that back. <laughs> and he said, or what? So I swung, and I hit him right there, right in the gut. I might as well hit that brick wall. It did nothing. And then I stood there, and I looked at him for what seemed like a long, long time, but really it wasn't, and then he started swinging. And I was a punching bag. Boom, 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 boom. I don't know how many times he hit, but I guess I maybe felt the first couple or three before I was completely gone. Knocked me out, I hit the floor, I was gone. When I woke up, the paramedics were laying me on a stretcher. And Rocky had been taken off somewhere. We were both suspended from school for several days. I didn't need an excuse not to come back for a while. I couldn't see anything. I remember when my mom came to pick me up, they never took me to the hospital. But when she came to pick me up, I remember worrying that I was going to be punished for being in a fight. And she very wisely said it looked like I had already been punished. I learned then that it's just not really smart to pick a fight with somebody named Rocky. <laughs> and who's that much bigger and older and just has a reputation for hurting things. That, I think, would be the difference between my fight with Rocky and 
Jacob's fight with God. God never really wants to hurt us. Ever. We hurt each other. We say things. We do things. We imply things. We let things happen. We ignore things. God always notices things and loves us and scoops us up and brings us in. And sometimes in the process of all of that, we, we walk away with a scar or we walk away with a limp. Who knows? But we walk away with God. The beautiful part of that story we never really got to. The scripture says in the very next chapter of the book of Genesis that Israel, the man formerly known as Prince Jacob, built an altar, an altar where he loved God because that was the place that God made Israel. The fight took place there. It was remembered as a beautiful place, not a bad place. Not long, or I should say part of my struggle when I decided that I didn't want to have anything to do with God or God's people or God's church or anything like that, one of the things that I always said to myself was I would never be able to take God up on the invitation to the meal. And I hesitated. I would visit churches and they would gather around a table just like this one and they would say, this table is for everyone. And I would sit in my seat and I would say, that table is for everyone but me. I struggled with it for a long, long time. And then it occurred to me one day that I am a part of everyone. <laughs> the fight, the struggle was within myself my past, what I had been told and what I had been taught in my past life, it was not with God. So this morning, if you're here, we're about to extend the invitation to come and to eat at this table. We'll serve you. You don't even have to get up. Call it breakfast in bed if you want. We'll bring it to you. But if you sit there today and you wonder if this meal is for you, absolutely, positively, don't doubt it for one second. God says it's for everyone. And that's you. So let's prepare for the meal. Come to the table of grace. Come to the table of grace. This is God's table. It's not yours or mine. Come to the table of grace. Come to the table. Come to the table of love. Come to the table of love. This is God's table. It's not yours or mine. Come to the table of love. Come to the table. Let's pray. God is great. God is good. Lord, we thank you for this food. Bless it. Use it. And remind us of your goodness. Remind us of the gift this meal is and remind us of the gift of this opportunity to join you, to join your family, to be a part of your family and to pull a chair up to this table. Remind us of your example, of the way to treat others, to treat our world, to treat the stranger, to treat the highest and the lowest of our society, to always treat them the way you would. Remind us of the way you walked, 
the words you said. Remind us of your deeds and remind us of the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The night that Jesus, his disciples, and the crowd gathered around, they were in this room. This room saw a lot of action, you know. I mean, it's where they all gathered and congregated, and it's where they would meet at the end of the day and do their debriefs. It's where they would get up in the morning and enjoy the morning meal and talk before they all went about their day. And this particular night, it's where they all gathered. They gathered and they had the meal and they had the conversation and they were friends and they hugged one another and they laughed. Had a big old time. I do believe. And then the moment came that Jesus took the bread. It was significant and it was important and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to those disciples. He gave it to those in the room and he said, take the bread. Take a bite, eat, and remember this night, and remember this moment, and remember the significance of it, because tomorrow it's going to be a doozy. So remember this night, and remember the gift that I've given to you. And then he took the cup, he blessed it, and he said, when you think of this moment, and when you think of this cup, I want you to think of the sacrifice that I've made for you so that in 2018, a little group of people at a church on Don Anna Drive in Lexington, Kentucky can look back and remember the sacrifice. He passed the cup. They took a drink and he said, do this. And when you do this, remember me. So this morning, the bread's going to come to you and just take a piece. The cup will come to you and take a cup. Pause and reflect for just a moment. And remember the gift that Christ has given to you. Amen.
I love it when I pick up an offering plate and there's seed money in there. <laughs> I remember going to uh, my grandmother's house who lived on a farm when I was very young. They kept that little cup next to the pump so they could prime it. That cup always had water in it. <laughs> they said that helped the water come out a lot quicker if you could use that little cup of water to, to start with. God, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you through giving. Use these gifts to honor yourself and to draw others to you. We pray in your name. Amen. What a beautiful day. What a beautiful day. Again, we're just so delighted that you've uh, chosen to come and be with us this morning. I hope you'll run around the neighborhood and see what kind of kids you can snatch up, not in a malicious way. <laughs> Let whoever's in charge of them know that you're there uh, and plan to bring them to Vacation Bible School. I believe it's going to be wonderful. This morning, if you're here, and maybe the first time or the first uh, few times, maybe you've been here a little while with us, but you've decided this is a kind of church family you'd love to belong to, we would love to have you. So this morning as we sing our opening hymn, I would just invite you to come and let me know that that's your desire and your wish, and we'll just bring you into the family and assign you something for the potluck. Because <laughs> that's kind of the way we do it. As we sing our closing hymn, one of my favorite songs, The Summons.
attract or scare? Will you let me answer prayer in you and you? sound wonderful as always. Last week I mentioned it's when we announced that Pastor Marsha is going to be taking some time away. Some of you were with us this past Friday night at uh, her niece Jen's service uh, over at Clark Legacy Center. And it was, it was a beautiful moment and Marsha has felt the love. Whether you were able to make it there or not, Marsha has felt your love and it's encouraged her and given her strength. But one of the things that we've asked her to do is just take time to recover. Uh, and take, take time to be able to just recenter in, take time for herself and for Bren and her family. And the elders have said, we're going to step in. Actually, they always do. We're just saying it with words this time, but they always step in. Uh, and we're going to be there to help with the spiritual care and the spiritual nurture and the spiritual needs of our church. So as we dismiss this morning, just as we did last week, I'm going to ask the elders to join me uh, in the back of the church because we want you to know exactly who those folks are. So you can stop and you can chat with them and talk with them. And if you have a concern or a care or a need, you can share that with them. So as we leave this morning, I'll ask the elders to join me there. From this point on, let's go forth. You may have a fight or two in front of you this week. You just might. You never know. You just never know. But you're going equipped and you're going prepared and you're going knowing that God is on your side. God is with you. Amen? Amen. Amen. So go in that grace and love. Amen.